all of us in this room, including I, probably think that we are really good interviewers. That I look into your eyes and I just feel it. Um, and the problem with that feeling, of course, is that I feel it even more if somebody looks like me, if somebody comes from Switzerland and shares the same hobby, and all of that. Now, it's not intentional that I want to do that, but we know we can't help. So it's not that nothing useful ha um, happens in the interview at all, but our mind is incapable of filtering out the noise from the useful information. So a true story in my life is when I was academic dean and one of my main jobs was hiring faculty for Harvard, I interviewed somebody who told me at the end of the interview um, that she also was a synchronized swimmer. I used to be a synchronized swimmer and I knew she would make for a great professor at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> so what, are we, what can we do? Um, so first of all, move from unstructured interviews to structured interviews. A structured interview means that you define the questions beforehand. You think about the five or seven questions that you want to ask, and you ask those five questions of all of the candidates who apply for a particular job. And you write the answers to the questions question by question. So you kind of are honest with yourself, and you try to make sure that you really give everyone an equal shot, not just depending on what sports team they root for or what country they come from. So use structured interviews. Secondly, Think about something that we call work sample tests. And I'm going to give you a very concrete example. I recently hired a new executive assistant. And we did three things. So first, we blinded ourselves to demographic characteristics. We evaluated all the CVs. And we put them in a box. We then had everyone do a work sample test. And the work sample test, quite literally, was a little bit of a task that I designed, thinking of the kinds of things that the person will be doing for me, which are really important to me. So one task, for example, was um, planning a trip. And so everyone had to do a two-hour work sample test online where they planned a trip for me, did some other things, answered some complicated emails, just to see whether the person is up to, to the task. And as you might imagine, that is the very best predictor of future performance, if you can mimic, basically, what the person is going to be doing. We rated those, we put them in a box, and then I actually did interview the people with a structured interview. And it was, of course, a bit strange because I said, well, I kind of don't know who you are, and I don't, you know, but, you know, we're, we're now meeting. Um, but I had, in the end, three independent observations. I had interview scores, I had scores for the work sample tests, and I had scores for the CVs. And we ended up hiring, you know, somebody um, at the end. Um, but think about work sample tests. And the last thing I want to say about this cheesy slide is do not think that diversity on the hiring committee itself is going to solve your problems. Many of these biases are shared. I'm now going to simplify things a little bit. Um, but honestly, it is much more important who we see than who we are ourselves. So for example, in the Heidi Howard case, women were as biased against Heidi as the, ma as the male students. And my husband was as biased against the male kindergarten teacher as I was when we dropped off our child. Right? It's a bit more complicated than that. And there's, of course, intersectionality between gender, race, nationality that I um, go more into depth in the book. But do remember that seeing really is believing. And by having diverse committee itself won't solve the problem. You have to help the people with the right processes to make it easier for them to, in fact, see talent where it is rather than you know, where their um, affiliations might lie. <laughs>